Hello, and welcome to the launch of Identifying as Arab in Canada. My name is Oyinda Mala Alaka, and I'm the Pro Promotions and Publicity Manager for Fernwood Publishing. I'm excited to kick off this event, so please do subscribe to Fernwood's YouTube channel to know when we have exciting events or exciting content uploaded. To start off, I would like to acknowledge that I am calling from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 Territories, original lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the own lands of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the arms and mistakes of the past and the present. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. As an immigrant to this land myself, I recognize my privilege as a settler in this land and I dedicate myself to working in partnership with indigenous communities in my location. Tonight's event is brought to you by Fernwood Publishing and is also part of the Israeli Appetite Week, sorry, Israeli Appetite Week Montreal. So do check out the Israeli Appetite Week Montreal on Facebook. You can order a copy of Identifying as Arab in Canada via website friendwithpublishing.ca. It is currently 20% 20, 20 off till March 24th at 11.59 AST. Some housekeeping before we start. There is a live chat on your screen. Please leave any questions and comments there. There will be an opportunity towards the end for the speakers to answer any questions that you have. The chat is also being moderated and any racist, sexist, or homophobic or transphobic comments will be deleted. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jala Hamza. Jala Hamza is an associate professor of Arab history at University de Montréal. She is the editor of The Making of the Arab Intellectual by Ruth Ledge 2013 and the author of the forthcoming Mohammed Rashid Rida Ula Tonad Salafiste by CNRS Editions. She is currently involved in two major research projects, one concerned with the cultural history of Arab nationalism and with the role played by Palestine educators and historians in that movement. The other with Levantine diasporas in the Americas, especially during and right after the mandate periods. Please welcome our moderator for tonight, Jala Hamza. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. It is a great pleasure uh, for me to be uh, to participate uh, in the launch of uh, this book by author uh, Huda Hassan, uh, Identifying as Arab in Canada, A Century of Immigration History, a book that uh, seeks to rectify uh, the invisibilization of uh, uh, the Arab of Canada uh, by exploring their migratory trajectories. Um, um, I am going uh, uh, this evening first to uh, present uh, Huda Hassan and also to present um, Muna Saloum and Khaled Muammar, who are two uh, prominent uh, figures of this uh, Arab community uh, in Canada, witnesses and actors uh, of um, the uh, organizing uh, of this community, as I will have um, the opportunity of uh, uh, mentioning uh, afterwards. Uh, I will start, of course, uh, by our author, uh, Huda, uh, who holds a PhD in socio history and whose uh, PhD thesis was first published uh, in French by uh, the Presse de l'Université de Montréal under the title Se dire Arabe au Canada. Um, un siècle d'histoire migratoire, and uh, now translated into English as Identifying as Arab in Canada, a Century of Immigration History, uh, that Fernwood Publishing has had the brilliant idea of um, uh, having translated and published. Uh, Huda uh, was a postdoc fellow at McGill University in Montreal, and uh, associate researcher uh, at the Maurice Alboix uh, Center of the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Uh, her work mostly focuses on immigration, social movements, racism, and Islamophobia. She has published more than 15 articles and book chapters and given talks to a wide variety of audiences on these topics. And uh, I am again very glad to be uh, 
hosting her uh, uh, with uh, Fernwood Publishing uh, this evening and hope to put uh, to her some questions that have been um, suggested to me uh, by reading her uh, amazing book. Uh, Khaled Muhammad, um, you are a Christian Palestinian Canadian uh, whose family was forced to flee uh, your hometown Nazareth in 1948 during uh, the Nakba. Uh, you are a founding member uh, of uh, CAF, C-A-F, uh, the Canadian Arab uh, Federation, uh, of which you served three terms as the national president. You are also a former member of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. And in 1977, you received the Queen Silver Jubilee Award uh, from the Governor, Governor General of Canada. Uh, Khaled, you are a very important figure of Arab organizing in Canada and a tireless advocate of the Palestinian cause, uh, as Huda's book shows uh, through uh, archives and interviews uh, with you and uh, several testimonies. Muna, uh, Muna Saloum, uh, you are a freelance uh, author and writer residing in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, you hold a master's degree in Middle East and Islamic studies from the University of Toronto specializing in the socioeconomic history of the Arabs in Spain. You've published uh, articles on stereotyping issues uh, and topical subjects about the Middle East in various Canadian newspapers, magazines and book chapters. Currently, you write articles about international and Canadian cuisine and travel. And you've co-authored uh, many books uh, about uh, um, recipes and cuisine. I'll give uh, uh, a few examples. The Sweets of Araby, Enchanting Recipes from the Tales of the 1001 uh, Nights, published in 2011. Shahrazad's Feasts, Foods of the Medieval Arab World, published by Pennsylvania University Press in 2013. And uh, um, The Scent of Pomegranate and Rose Water, Reviving the Beautiful Food Traditions of Syria, uh, published by Arsenal Pulp Press in 2018. It should be mentioned that uh, Muna is also the daughter of the late Habib Saloum, uh, who has a, quite an important place in Huda's book. Uh, Habib Saloum was an important character of the history of Arab immigration in Canada. He was born in 1924, immigrated to Saskatchewan the same year, and moved to Toronto in 1945. And he was an active member of the Canadian Arab Friendship Society in the 60s and 70s. And I think, Mona, you will be talking uh, about your father's important contribution to the Arab heritage culture in Canada uh, that uh, Huda has extensively documented in her research. Uh, but uh, without enough, uh, with the presentations and uh, without much uh, ado, I will uh, turn to um, Huda, uh, uh, whom I will ask to uh, give us a brief presentation of the book. Uh, and then I will also be, we will be moving to um, Muna and Khaled, who will also be reacting uh, to the book and uh, also talking about uh, their experience as uh, Arab Canadians. Uh, or Canadian Arabs, sorry. Um, we've planned it like uh, for uh, every speaker to uh, give a 10 minute presentation, after which I will uh, pop back in, put a few questions before we open the floor uh, to our uh, uh, listeners. So please, Huda, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. So thank you for attending this lounge. This book is the result of a doctoral research of several years, published first in French, as you said, uh, Diala. And I have always thought that this translation was necessary. So I am happy I was able to find a publisher whose publication and positions, political, obviously, I am proud of, Fernwood Publishing. So thank you, Owinda, too. This English version also gave me the opportunity to rework the text and improve it. Also, thank you to uh, my friend and brilliant translator, Mary Foster. I would also like to thank today Diala Hamza here, to, uh, who accepted to moderate, and the real actors of this book, of which Khaled Muammar and Mona Saloum are the representatives today. With many other important people who are in my book, um, they form this collective Arab-Canadian dynamic that I wanted to trace in my research. The objective of this book was precisely to give them back a voice, 
that I wanted to document through an important archival work and several interviews. So that, that's what, why I think Mona and Khaled testimonies today are very important to listen to. These voices are important also because until now, the history of Arab presence in Canada remain largely unknown and invisible. Historians who have studied this history are rare, so here I pay tribute to my predecessors, notably to Baha Abu Laban and Brian Abboud. So to retrace a bit uh, the research of 100 years of history of Arab immigration to Canada, I start with the origins of this immigration in the end of the 19th century to 1980. By analyzing a century of presence, I wanted to show the complexities of identity construction and organizational changes. But I also wanted to retrace the political actions of Canadian Arabs, because as the Algerian French sociologist Abdel Malik Sayyad says, to exist is to exist politically. Explaining the mobilizations of minority, their strength at some period, but also their failures helps to understand the presence. This is important for the, their descendants and communities, but also for the whole Canadian society they are totally part of. So the book and the research I, I conducted is divided into four chronological periods. So the first period is the time of the pioneers, when the first people came from the Mashrik, or more precisely from what was called Bilad al-Sham, or Greater Syria. These migrants who came to Canada at the end of the 19th century were part of a big movement leaving the Ottoman Empire to settle in the Americas. They became peddlers and traders and established themselves all over Canada. They quickly established their first churches, newspaper, association, while trying to survive. Then come the period of establishment in the 1930s and 40s, where the descendants of the first generation became Canadian, had children, integrated, and also start fighting for their rights. They notably contested discrimination, in particular restrictive migration laws, which prohibited the entry of, of Asians into Canada for decades. During these years, I described the Orientalist perception of these population by the Canadian state and their own ambivalent positioning in the ra racial hierarchy and the way they choose to contest it. They were classified as unwanted immigrants with Orientalist stereotypes, but they were not considered as bad as other Asian groups, such as Chinese, for example. I then deal with the post-war period after 1945 that I define as a transition period with the arrival of heterogeneous new waves of immigrants from the Middle East. I describe the slow opening of Canadian borders and their discriminatory practices, more open towards ethnic and religious minorities from some specific Arab countries. And in the last part, I document what I call the years of political assertion, the 1960s and the 1970s. Actually, it's my favorite part in the book. It's the one that is closest to our days and where we can see continuities with the present. So the new generation who was coming during these years met the old one and many organizations developed and together they fought for the rights of Arab people in the home country and in Canada. They denounced the stigmatization of Arabs in the media already at the time and Canada's position in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Khaled Muammar can talk about this period and the important action of the Canadian Arab Federation, but also the surveillance and hostility the, activi the activists experienced at that time and later. Habib Saloum, Mona's father, lived through all the periods I describe actually in the book. He was a baby in the 1920s when his parents immigrated to Canada. He and James Peters are among the most important figures as they have been active in the Arab community scene for several decades. They all used to have meetings in the Saloum's house, actually. And this is where I myself met Mona, Khaled, and other important figures of the Toronto Arab scene, such as Ibrahim Hayani. I also have to recall and pay tribute here to the people I met in Montreal, like Edmond Omran, Bill Lawand, and others. I owe a special thanks to Louis Azaria, who helped me a lot, and to the late Rizek Faraj, who was central in the history of Arab presence from the 1970s until he passed away a few years ago. So I think why it's important to know this history is also it's, it, it helps to understand the history of Canada as a country. I wanted first to document the point of view of the Arab communities over a century, but I also focused on the role of the Canadian state, 
a colonial state whose very existence is based on the dispossession of indigenous people's lands. In my research, I tried to understand the position of immigrants in this history through the specific experience of the Arab immigrants. I was interested in their discourse on that front, and I found some anecdotes about their relationship to indigenous populations. Habib Saloum, for instance, told me that in the 1920s, after a few years of peddling, the Canadian government offered his father a farm. He had no idea of the irony of this offer, he told me. And I quote, the Canadian government had stolen this land from the indigenous people to give it to us peasants from Syria. This parallel is also the more, is, is all the more striking since there is still a certain relevance to it today and that many activists group fighting for social justice try to take into account today by recognizing the theft of land and the necessary solidarity with indigenous struggles. From colony to colony, this question hovered over my research very strongly, across the spectrum of Palestine, obviously. This allowed me to understand the support of colonial Canada to the colonial state of Israel since the beginning in the 1945. And I document how Canada was a strong supporter of the creation of Israel. Through correspondence and archival documents, I analyzed the hostility Canada expressed toward the demands for self-determination of the Palestinian people in their homeland and as they were made by Canadian Arab groups and activists. We can see that this hostility is still strong today. So I, I also think telling the past is also important to understand the present. Today, we see a growing interest in the history of minorities in general, the racism they have suffered and their struggles. This dynamic is driven by activists and descendants of this population who demand that their story be told and that their voices be heard because this past has an impact on the present. Hence, for me, the importance of being part of this movement that includes recalling the reality of indigenous dispossessions of their lands, their lives, and their culture, reminding the history of slavery in Canada and the racism suffered by different generations of Black communities until today, the exploitation of migrants from Asia at different times, their work and, their, and the laws that discriminated them, and we can notice a growing hostility against these groups today. But also understanding current xenophobic movements by recalling the history of racism in Canada is essential to counter the, the multicultural the denial of these rea realities and their consequences today. In this history, the Arab populations perceived as undesirable were not the most discriminated group in the Canadian racial hierarchy. But for various reasons, which I try to highlight in the conclusion of the book, their situation has actually deteriorated. I end my book with hypotheses on the continuities with the current situation, in particular global Islamophobia, how we went from the Orientalist image of the Arabs to the Palestinian terrorist threat and to the repulsive figure of the Muslim. This comes with the undeniable observation of growing discrimination against these groups, considered as a broad mix of Arabs and Muslim, and like other, other groups mixed in this, in this big, broad uh, category, with hateful discourse and acts against them today in Canada. If the situation is not really going in the right direction for Canadian Arabs today, I would like to stress that they should not be seen simply as victim and passive, because they always raise their voices, try to mobilize and resist. That's why recalling the ancient presence of these populations in Canada, how rich their culture and identities are and document their struggles, should contribute to their recognition and perhaps restore a certain dignity. That's why, again, I think the testimonies of Mona, Saloum, and Khaled Muammar are so important to listen to today. So thank you very much. And now uh, I can give the floor now to Mona. Hello, everybody. My name is Mona Saloum. And thank you very much for all the nice introductions. My contribution to this presentation deals with the first of the four periods, the time of the pioneers. Now, my father is Habib Saloum, and um, his parents and also my mother's parents were part of this Canadian immigration story, the early period, that is, the first part. Both sides arrived in Canada between 1920 and 1925. My grandparents on both sides came from Greater Syria or Bilad Sham. As Huda has correctly stated, they too were part of the peasant wave. They did, however, have some education. 
My mother's mother went to school in Damascus where she was born. She could read, write, speak Arabic, English, Russian, and some Turkish. My father's mother had elementary school education and could read and write Arabic. My paternal grandparents left due to the stagnant and basically horrendous economic conditions in their village. Even though they owned their own land, they were not making any profit from it because of the high taxation imposed by the Ottoman authorities. My grandfather, my, that's Jiddi, that's my father's father, was conscripted in, even into the Ottoman army where horses were fed rather than the Arab army men. He became ill at one point with typhoid and the Ottoman army left him to basically for dead when after a few hours, three Bedouin women found him and they nursed him back to life. He walked back to his village, he got married, and then he attempted to begin a new life. But life was hell for him living under even now the French mandate that had been imposed on Syria after the First World War. What had, brought on, what had been brought on by Ottoman corruption and weak and inept leadership, especially during the 19th, late 19th century and the early 20th century at which it came to a head, was now replaced with a mandate by the French colonial powers to control the lands of the East for their own purposes. The Ottomans had ruled for centuries. Life as farmers, for my grandparents and for all the other peasants of the time, was no easy task. The economy was declining. There were more taxes and even more tax collectors. There was turmoil, unrest, and tension, and instability. Despite this, my father, my father's father continued to work hard so that both he and my grandmother could raise a family and not worry about where the next mouthful of food would come from. He was both farmer and merchant trader. He wanted to be master of his own destiny. Now, both my paternal and maternal grandparents had relatives in Canada when they came to um, apply to come to this country. They traveled to Canada to start a new life and create a better economic condition for themselves. For my father's parents, it had all started with a letter that arrived from a relative in Canada. A person by the name of Dawood or David in English Saloom was looking for help on a homestead that he had located that he owned and was located just south of Vanguard in uh, Saskatchewan. On my mom's side, her mother, who was born and bred in Damascus, left Syria because of social mores. She was a Christian widow at the age of 16 and ha who had a son because her husband had died at such a young age and as such remarriage for the Christian Arab women at that time was never a possibility. Her father ha ha was more, uh, more uh, open-minded in the sense that he wanted his daughter to have a better life or to start a new life because she was so young. So he sent her along with her half-sister to Canada. And that's how my grandmother on my mother's side came to uh, this country. My, uh, my mother's mother came with the intention of starting a new life, which really meant uh, finding, there was a large community growing in Montreal uh, of, Syri of Syrian immigrants, so she could probably begin a new life by marrying somebody there, which she eventually did. Both sides of my family, I don't talk about religion, but I have to explain, both sides of my, fa of my parents' family were Syrian Orthodox or Arab Orthodox, and um, they, we never discussed, uh, growing up, we never discussed religion, to be honest, because we had friends from all over the Arab world. Um, eventually, when I came to begin, well, I spoke Arabic as a child at home, but when we started school, we lost a lot of the um, ability to speak, but we always understood. But my father and mother made it a point especially my father, that we learned the alphabet when we were young to continue the tradition of the linguistic tradition. My mother kept us up to date on all of the custom or customary traditions of how a girl should be, the kind of life that we should have, that kind of thing. Anyways, both my paternal grandparents planned to prosper, then eventually, even on my mother's side, to return home. Um, both sides left uh, Syria um, on a ship that went from Beirut, Syria, because that's what it was called then, to Marseille, and then they came to Canada. My grandparents on my father's side going to Quebec City, and then they took a train to Saskatchewan. And my grandmother, she, my mother's mother, went to Halifax and then on to Montreal with her sister. Uh, my, my maternal grandmother settled in Montreal and was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Tamar Aborizic, who she eventually married, but he died very early when my mother was a young girl, so I never got to meet him, but I did hear a lot about him. Uh, he had lived in northern Ontario, where there were a number of Syrian immigrants who became miners up there. 
Although married, my grandmother Nabiha stayed in Montreal while her husband worked in Cobalt, that's in Northern Ontario, and he would return home so every often. Um, on my father's side, my grandfather had come with a vision of owning his own land because, uh, and to make his own profits. As he explained many times to us as children, a man can only be a man if he owns his own land. The only people he knew out in Saskatchewan that he met were the Syrians from the area from where he came from. He was from the Karaun, in, which is now in Lebanon. It's in the Bukah Valley. All the people he knew were his relatives and governor, and another Saloum was already living there. Already, oh, basically, he had come a few years before. Musa Saloum was the name of this other gentleman who had a store, a general store in the city of governor, the little city of governor. And uh, my grandfather ended up having to work for, uh, where he worked with David Saloum because he was paid. He moved from the farm when he first came where he was working for David Saloum, but he wasn't being paid. You know, the relative didn't pay his relatives, so he went on to become a trader. He became a peddler under the auspices of this other saloon. Uh, it was on one of his peddling trips that he learned that the federal government was willing to sell homesteads or give out homesteads of approximately four, uh, located 40 miles south of this place called Governor. So my grandfather went out and saw the land, paid $10 to the administration fee, and he ended up with um, 160 acres of land. But then he, the land didn't seem that great, but he went and bought another, another quarter section. So he ended up with quite a bit of acres of land, and that's how he began his life as a farmer. My father's parents now owned at this point 50 acres of land, a broken land, with the rest being pasture. It also, uh, he on the land was also an unfinished house. All of this is important because for me, this is how I was raised learning these stories of history, not ancient history, not medieval history, not post medieval or, plo or uh, post classical. This is all this is all history that that was part of my blood, part of my being or how I came to be. This to me was very important. And thank goodness that my father was a great writer and a great reader because he felt that the oral tradition in one sense was extremely important, but the written word was even more. Um, from this little dwelling on the farm, my grandparents came to succeed in their life. They moved on from a, from living as poor farmers to just poor farmers in a sense, and eventually a little bit more affluent. They were able to purchase, for example, um, horses and farm animals. They grew their own vegetables. They lived, remember, during the Depression, and they also lived during the um, the great drought in Saskatchewan, which lasted for seven years. But I have to say something. One of the most important thing about these immigrants, they knew how to survive, not just my father's family, but the other Syrian immigrants around them. And I'm speaking only of Saskatchewan at the moment because they were able to survive by old country methods. My grandfather, for example, when he arrived, he brought with him uh, lentils and chickpeas in his pocket, which were completely unheard of in this part of, in, in Canada, that is for sure. And he grew the and he grew the lentils and chickpeas, which of course flourish in dry conditions. So they always had these these pulses on hand, and they stored them during the winters. They also made made um, they preserved meat, for example. They didn't have refrigeration in the early years, so they made something called kawarma, which I I'm pretty sure most of the Arabs don't eat anymore. That is from the eastern part of the Arab world. It's basically meat that's chopped up and boiled in uh, fat, in lamb fat preferably, sometimes beef, and uh, it preserves itself within the fat, you don't have to refrigerate it. So they had meat constantly for the 12 months in the year. So, a base, and also, I should also say that my grandparents built their own house, again, the first house uh, in the adobe tradition. They, they created adobe and built bricks and built the house. And eventually, of course, everything changed. But they were survivors, they lived a very harsh life, but they came to enjoy it. Although my grandmother, my mo my father's mother, always told us that every night she would cry wanting to go back to the old country. The, again, this is one of the features of the first major generation, that first wave or that first part, as Huda calls them, because they had, an, they had the idea of making the money and going back to the old country and settling there. It never happened on both my... Uh, paternal and maternal grandparents' side because there was never time. They had families and the families grew here and they ended up living the life of a Canadian. But for my father, it was a different story. 
as a child, he always had this vision that there was something beyond the farm. In school, that was his favorite part of his young life, going to school and reading the books in the library. He read and read, and then he set, he read the books again, and he knew that there was something beyond. When at home, my grandmother, my father's mother, that is, my grandmother would tell the, her children, there were eight of them, she would tell them stories about the old country, what it was like to live in Syria, what it was like to eat figs, what it was like to have olives, tahina. They didn't have tahina, so they, my grandmother made made use of peanut butter as a replacement for tahina. They had uh, dates, dates, the mainstay of the Arab diet. They couldn't even get them out in Saskatchewan. It wasn't, it was only about about five or six years later after they'd settled the general store started to open up with some goods, but it ended up my grandfather would order these kind of goods, the olives and the figs and the dates from Montreal. It would take a while to get to them, but they got them anyways. But my grandmother talked of this, this, this Eden, this paradise that, that she came from, even though they had to leave because it was so bad. But it was more the social life, the social aspect of living in Canada as the, uh, during the, as old stock Canadians was very, very difficult because the, as I said, the only people that they really mixed with were the other Syrians, and those Syrians were placed miles and miles apart. So it was only during the big festivities, during Easter, Christmas, and even the Eid for the for the Muslim population, the very small Muslim population, because they had very close friends who were Muslim, they would all celebrate together. There was no, they, they crossed religious lines, it didn't matter. As long as they spoke the same language, they had some kind of unity, and that's how it came to be. Growing up on this, my father decided that he had to leave the farm. And one day when he was 15, he told his parents, I'm leaving, and he literally left. And he went and um, went to Regina, got some work there. And then eventually, when he was almost 17, he joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Why did he do it? He was afraid of being conscripted. This was 1943, late 43. And of course, the war was still going on, and there was word that there was conscription going on, especially in the army. So my father figured it would be too dangerous. So he joined the Air Force. They trained him in Regina, and by 1944, he flew. To, he sorry, he took the ship to England. For him, this was the most exciting venture of his life because he was literally leaving the farm, leaving Saskatchewan, and that those harsh depression years and the drought. He got to England, and there he was trained. But mo many days he was on. Um, I don't. Re I don't know the term, but he he was he had a vacation vacation time during certain days of the week, and he used to spend his time in the libraries. And in the libraries, I have to tell you one other thing that's really important. When he was in school, as a child, he and his siblings would go to school and constantly they were harassed, bullied because of their color, because of their clothes, but they were called black Syrians. The epithet of black, black, Syrian, black Syrian always was stuck at the back of my father's mind. And he, he'd go home and tell his father and mother, they're calling us black Syrian. And they, my father would get beat, beat up by these other kids and his siblings too, your black Syrians. And he didn't understand what, what the problem was with being Syrian or black Syrian. What is this? What is this? My grandfather and grandmother said, just keep your head held high. They don't know what we are. They don't understand kind of thing. But my father wanted to learn. So when he was in England, he started, he said, geez, let me think. Black Syrians, what are these black Syrians? Oh, okay, so I'm going to read about the Syrians. He read about the Syrians as he explained to us. And he thought, wow, this is really great. What a history, what a history. And then he connected it. With Arab history, of course, we are part of the Arab world. And from that point, in all honesty, from when he was about 18, he decided he had a mission in life. He had to tell others how good our people were or how good our ancestors were. I mean, not everybody's perfect, but there was a great history behind that term Syrian or Arab. When he came back, he went out west to Van he Regina and then to Vancouver. And in Vancouver, he decided he'd come to Toronto. In Toronto, he uh, had some relatives, but he wanted to work because there was constant employment in there were much more opportunities in Toronto. And it was in Toronto, he came in 1945 and 1949. He met my mother through relatives, she too, of, of course, of Syrian background. And he met her at the Syrian Bowling League, which was really cool, they had that. He met her and uh, they decided to get married a year later and a few years later they had us. So that's my background, that's my history. I have a very strong uh, attachment to the old country and because of my grandparents, because of my parents. As we grew up, we were told we had, we were taught the language, of course. Everything, 
in our house, whatever we did until we started kindergarten was all in Arabic, everything. So we only understood Arabic. When we started school, of course, we forgot how to speak it, like it happened so quickly, my mother said, but we still were able to understand it. We grew up in a household that had many types of visitors, of course, all of our relatives, that's, that's taken for granted, but the visitors we had became our family as well. They were predominantly from all across the Arab world, not just the Arab world, of course, non-speaking Arabic, um, Arabic guests, and uh, like our neighbors, other friends from my dad's work or my mother's friends, whatever, but it was mainly an Arab household with Arab friendship that, that we grew, in which we grew up and which very, very much influenced the way we thought and uh, eventually wrote. My Arabic is very good, but I can speak, I was telling Huda, my colloquial is terrible because I mix in all types of dialects. The classical Arabic is perfectly fine because I studied it. My father wanted us to be proud of what we were, and my father continued the tradition. He finished, he worked for the federal government for 36 years. He took early retirement so he could always do what he wanted to do, which was to write and to publish and to correct the image of the Arabs. He got involved with many people. One of them, of course, being Khalid. James Peters was his closest friend because they had a common history. To make it, to be honest, um, for my father, his life was his community and his family. And from that point, when he, when he became more, um, like in the 60s, he went twice across the entire Arab world with my mother because he wanted to experience the history, the people, the culture. Of course, not everything was perfect, but for him, it was the ideal launching ground for his writing career. And from that point, he continued. He, of course, he got involved with the organizations. He was involved, he was one of the founders of the Canadian Arab Friendship Society, he and James Peters. He was completely involved with the establishment of the Arab Community Center of Toronto. And of course, the Canadian Arab Federation, um, one of the uh, co-founders or one of the people that, that recommended that such an organization exist because he wanted to see the unity of the Arabs across the country. My father to me is one of the most, is the greatest man in the world. And he has, he has a, he has had left quite a great influence on not only his family, but other people as well who knew and loved him. So my sister and I grew up with this kind of background and we feel that we are carrying the torch for him because we tend to spend our time trying to say, look, we're not bad people. This is this is the way we are. This is our tradition. So let me correct you when you say this or that. Yes, I've had my my share of bullying and uh, derogatory remarks said to me when I was younger, but through the years I learned how to respond. And I think we do have the respect that we want. It's coming with age maybe or coming with um, years of experience. And something like Huda's book is going to be helping our community um, create a name for itself in this country because we're all part of the heritage. Uh, that's all I have to say, but I can also, also honestly say that without people like James Peters, Habib Saloum, Khalid Ma'amr, Khalid to me is the new generation that came, all of these people recognize that there is an image that we have here. I do identify myself as an Arab Canadian, not Canadian Arab because I was raised as an Arab first and I'm in Canada and I am a Canadian as well. So I have the best of both worlds, I, I like to say. And that's all I have to say for now. So I'm going to turn the floor to Khaled. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I'd like to start by saying that we should acknowledge and give tribute to the indigenous people of this country and ensure that um, the right for self-determination and their dignity is maintained and that no action is being undertaken regarding their lands without their prior knowledge and consent. And after that, I would like to applaud uh, Ambassador for producing this marvelous book where I'm sure uh, the research he did is, is something that few people are able to do. And I'm happy that he was able to do that on behalf of Arabs in Canada. Now, reading, reading the book, you know, I can understand the, uh, the, the challenges that faced uh, Arabs who came in, in the 19th century and the early 20th century because of the uh, uh, stereotypes about 
than uh, and and the ignorance about the background and that's and how they had to endure the laws which discriminated against them because at that time it only favored white Europeans uh, Asians and Africans were not considered equal human beings unfortunately uh, and following that, you know, even back in the 30s and 40s, when, when, when the issue of Palestine became uh, in the news, uh, these, uh, these immigrants had to also face the Zionist uh, uh, stereotypes and attacks against Arabs generally, which, which, uh, which influenced their presence in Canada. Uh, I came to Canada, as I said, in 65, and after six months of... Uh, I found a job right away with uh, with IBM uh, Canada after actually a month, and uh, I started working as a as a systems analyst. But after six months of uh, computer work, I was bored and I needed to meet Arabs. You know, I had met uh, I I had friends a Dutchman, a German, a Lithuanian, but no Arabs. So I ran to library and I saw a book so I knew that from the Arab League in Ottawa. So I, so I called them. I said, I am here and I'd like to contact some Arabs. They said, oh, we have a phone number of this man, James Peters. He belongs he has an association called Arab Friend, uh, Arab Canadian Arab Society. So, uh, so I contacted James. He said, we have a meeting uh, next week at the house of Habib Saloon. Give me the address. We went there and we met in the basement. It, it was a nice setting with, uh, with pouches. You sit on them on the floor, decorated beautifully. And there I met Habib and James. And since then, our friendship was, uh, was strengthened. And this is a society which really taught me how, first of all, to deal with other Arabs in a respective way, how to uh, uh, discuss issues without, uh, even though you have a different opinion, without getting into a fight. And uh, we used to meet at the Saloon's house and sometimes at, uh, at a room which was booked in Edwards Gardens. And from time to time, we used to, uh, Jim Peter would, uh, would invite us uh, to uh, improve our English, you know. So he had this book called The Naked Ape, <laughs> which was a funny book because it, uh, it showed the similarity between human beings and apes, you know, in many things, in our behavior. So it was a way to understand why human beings sometimes act uh, in a strange way. Uh, at the same time, uh, Habib was, uh, was, was, was an interesting person because even though he was born in Canada, in a sense, and he came from this town in Lebanon, he insisted he's a Syrian Arab, you know, he wouldn't accept any other terminology that was imposed by the colonialists, British and the French. So this was great. And that's how, after a little while, there was... There was an incident in, uh, when Israel attacked Jordan. At that time, the West Bank was under Jordan control. They attacked a, a town in, in, uh, in the West Bank called Samoa. And the, the Jordanian army, uh, with the support of the Palestinian resistance groups, was able to repulse that attack. The media in Canada presented it in such a distorted way, you know, is our terrorists that had to be, you know, uh, Israel went in to do that. And uh, as a result of that, a few Arabs in Toronto, which I had met by then, said we have to establish uh, an association to defend Palestinian rights. So that's how the Arab Palestine Association came into existence at, at the end of 1966. And strangely enough, not strangely enough, you know, what's as good about it, it shows you how, how people felt that, that they are all united. We had uh, a Lebanese, we had two Iraqis as founders, we had three Palestinians, and we had someone from the Gulf states. So we established the Arab-Palestine Association at the end of 66. 
And then another catastrophe happened in, in June of 67, and uh, the media was gloating about how these Arabs were defeated, how Egyptian soldiers, you know, they distorted the whole thing. They said Egyptian soldiers were so cowardly, they took off their shoes and ran in the Sinai to escape the Israeli army. Which, is, which doesn't make sense because the sand is hot in Sinai. You don't want to walk, you don't want to walk with your bare foot in the sand in, uh, in June, you know, it's burning hot. But this, so we felt angry, you know, the Canadian Arab Friendship Society of Jim Peter and, and Habib and, and the new society which was formed, the Arab Pass Association. Uh, we were contacted by another society in London called the Canadian Arab Friendship uh, society, and they said we should meet together and discuss how to deal with this, with this occupation of the Golan Heights, the rest of Palestine, and Sinai. So the three societies met in London. Uh, the leaders from London were uh, Ali Jbara and Dr. George Hajjar from Toronto, GP, Ali Saloum, myself, and uh, and Dr. Ibrahim Salti, who was uh, who was uh, a visiting doctor from Lebanon, who was doing his uh, internship uh, specialization, uh, we met with Dr. Mohammed Dukanish, who was an Egyptian uh, a professor of engineering at Hamilton uh, at McMaster University, and that's how the Kenya Federation was established at the end of 1967. Again, as I said, you know, there was Egyptians, Lebanese, Palestinians, Syrians, and we were united as Arabs. Great. And uh, following that, the Federation, uh, we started with three societies only, right? Canadian Arab Society of London, Canadian Arab uh, Friendship Society of Toronto, the Arab Palestine Association. And then the events, you know, continued in, in the Syrian war when, uh, when uh, again there was a war between Syria and Egypt who uh, were attacked by Israel. Uh, at that time, there was a decision by Canada to support, uh, as usual, you know, stand with, with Israel. And we had to speak out as Arabs, as, as a representative of the community. We had to stand up, and uh, and uh, but because of that, we became targeted. From '73 to '76, that we were, you know, there was surveillance of our activities in many ways. Uh, we, an Arab community center was established in '74, but but in '74, the, the, the center which was. Uh, was the center which was situated in a united in, in a Unitarian church. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean mute? Mute was mute was mute. I think we lost Thailand. Uh, maybe the disconnection uh, uh, is back. Maybe the disconnection will. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me better? Yes, actually, yeah. it, okay. it, it, it was a bad connection, Khaled. So, uh, yeah. Well, basically, you know, the Federation uh, mission was to protect the civil liberties and the human rights of Arabs specifically, and all Canadians. Uh, we, were, uh, we were against racism, against Arabs, against Muslims, against indigenous people. Uh, we also uh, wanted to support Palestinian rights for uh, Palestinian human rights for justice. And also, they, they can hear me. You, you can hear me clearly here, correct? Hello? Yeah, and uh, to, 
to accomplish that, we needed, first of all, to reach out to more Arab communities, which we did from 67, when we were three societies, by 1976, we had 15 societies in, uh, in cities like Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, Quebec City, Halifax, Montreal, and others. And uh, by 1981, we had 25 societies. And when I left in, um, in 2010, the Federation, we had 40 societies. But at the same time, we felt we needed to strengthen our bonds with uh, other communities, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with groups that face racism, with ethnic cultural groups, with uh, labor groups, with Muslim groups, and also uh, reach out to churches, because, like the United Church, the Unitarian Church, which were uh, more open-minded in, in dealing with, uh, with, with, uh, with racism issues. And this is why we had, uh, you know, we had, for example, uh, contacts. We joined, like I was a, you know, the Federation was a founding member of the Canadian Ethnocultural Council, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, created to represent the ethnocultural groups in Canada. There were Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, Armenians, uh, Sikhs, uh, Indians, Chinese, all of those groups. We, we were a founding member of that uh, group, and I was the secretary of the first executive of that board. And uh, also, we were active in the Urban Alliance on Race Relations in, in Ontario, and we had contact with labor groups, uh, and this was strengthened later after the 70s and 80s with people like Ali Mallah, who was, uh, who was uh, an executive member of the Federation, and he was uh, uh, a, 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 an active union member. So, so we've, we, we felt it's very important to reach out to, to all, of, all of Canadian societies because we were facing problems from the media bias and also the political parties who were uh, trying to silence our, voice, uh, our voices. But, uh, but luckily, you know, even though we were, uh, the, the, there was a surveillance against us, as I said, the fire that uh, burned down the Arab Community Center in 74, also the uh, the bugging the bugging of the offices of uh, of the uh, Palestinian society in Montreal of of Rizek Faraj Rizek Faraj uh, they had an office in a in a union building but somebody uh, uh, placed you know microphones in the walls to monitor what they were saying so when 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 a group from Montreal was trying to travel to in Khaled. New York, they were stopped at the border. <laughs> Khaled? Yes. Uh, excuse me. Uh, the, your connection is uh, is is really um, problematic. Uh, so I'm uh, unfortunately going to ask you to maybe wrap up uh, because uh, it's sometimes really um, uh, inaudible what you're saying so that we can maybe uh, move on to, to questions and then maybe come back to you with the hope that the connection will have uh, resumed. Okay. Well, okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, so basically, what, what, what I want to say is that uh, currently uh, the, the Arab community space is still facing challenges, but, um, but it's clear that there is a, a change happening because uh, more and more people are realizing that uh, Arabs are human beings like everybody else. Uh, there are representatives in, uh, in the government who are of Arab and Muslim descent. And they might not be speaking out as much, but, um, but uh, there is now a more understanding under the current government, at least, because during the Harper regime from 2006 to 2015, the, uh, the, Can the Canadian government will not meet with Arab, with Arab groups. They, they, they boycotted Arab groups. And they actually cut the funding to the Canadian Federation because it was supporting 
the Arab people and denouncing Israel's attacks against Lebanon in 2006 and, and, and in 2008 against Gaza. So, so this is, uh, there's a change in the air and uh, we are positive that, uh, that the future is, will be better. Actually, last week or this week, uh, the CTV just uh, put on on uh, they 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 uh, they had an interview with the, with the director of a Palestinian film called The Present, and and they were very favorable to how the Palestinians are suffering under Israel's occupation, and that this would uh, resonate with Canadians, especially people who are refugees and new immigrants. So, so let us be positive that the winds are changing in the right direction. Thank you uh, very much uh, to uh, the three of you uh, for uh, these um, uh, interventions into, uh, well, first to Huda uh, for uh, summarizing in a way uh, her book and to Muna and uh, Khaled uh, for these uh, insights into uh, their uh, personal lives and uh, and experiences. Um, How did you log into this? I am Your hearing... Your connection is horrible. Your computer sucks. How do you... Khaled, I am hearing voices, which is a bit problematic for... <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I am going to uh, put questions... Um, Brief questions to the three of you. Um, starting with the with the Huda. Well, first Huda, uh, I uh, don't know where to start uh, uh, as far as um, this um, amazing piece of scholarship is concerned. You've retraced uh, with painstaking details um, the uh, construction of. Uh, uh, th these Arab communities in Canada, the construction of their identities, you've shown how uh, they were trapped at times and how they, they still had agency to circumvent um, the categories that the C Canadian state was trying to impose on them. Um, um, the book uh, is full of gems. Uh, I will probably at some point uh, uh, refer to some of them. But maybe I, I will uh, keep it short to start with by putting uh, one maybe uh, broad question to you, uh, which addresses uh, one of the ambitions of the book, which is, um, as the blurb of Fenwood uh, Publishing says, um, um, uh, you are trying to rectify uh, the invisibilization of uh, those uh, Arab uh, Canadian Arabs uh, uh, through uh, through your work, um, uh, and you you have been researching basically a community that has largely been unaware of its own history. So the invisibilization uh, works both ways. Uh, Canadian Arabs were invisibilized by the Canadian state or marginalized and discriminated against, but the Arab communities uh, were for a long time uh, uh, unaware of their own history and maybe invisibilized uh, uh, themselves uh, uh, th through, through, um, through this. So uh, the question is um, relates to this uh, to this point, um, and also maybe uh, in connection to this, I wanted to ask you uh, to maybe comment uh, uh, the uh, excerpts with which uh, you. I mean, the, sorry, the dedication of your book. Uh, which is to my grandfather, America's orphan. So in connection to what I've, I was just uh, saying about this community that has been uh, unaware of itself, but also uh, invisibilized, uh, could you maybe uh, reflect, and this is a personal question I know, uh, about this uh, grandfather uh, who was America's orphan, and uh, more specifically, how... Uh, did the personal intersect with uh, the the research, and and how were you able to negotiate 
the the personal and uh, well maybe the professional or the academic pursuit. Let's put it this way. Um, to um, to Muna, uh, I would like to ask uh, the following question. Um, um, your father was born in 1924, if I uh, remember well, which is exactly one year after um, France started, uh, and it was obligated actually by the uh, um, League of Nations to actually uh, call the future Lebanese and the future Syrians forth to actually declare uh, their nationality. So your grandparents and your father, when they arrived in Canada, they were already, uh, they, they already had their new uh, nationalities, uh, or didn't they? Okay, okay, so I will ask you to reflect on that. And um, if, if so, or if not, because uh, apparently uh, uh, this was not the case, how, uh, um, how much did Habib Saloum actually uh, contribute to um, uh, make his family and the community at large aware of that uh, huge event, which is actually mm, mm, uh, being uh, now researched by people uh, like Huda, and uh, my, I myself have been trying to uh, uh, document this as far as the Brazilian uh, Arab communities were concerned, which is that these, uh, some of these peoples left and came to America, to the Americas, as Ottomans, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the polity of which they were part, whether they liked it or not, disappeared overnight. And uh, colonial entities replaced uh, the empire, and they were given a very short uh, uh, window in which to come forth and declare their nationalities, which was done at the French consulate or embassies uh, when they were abroad, uh, and which were done in Lebanon or uh, Syria when they were still uh, in, in the countries of origin. Um, so given his role, uh, as documented by Huda, uh, his huge role, I mean, his, his role is uh, uh, bigger than life, <laughs> but given uh, his role in bridging uh, generations in Canada, uh, the different Arab generations in Canada, I was wondering if you could expand on this specific point of, you know, Ottoman uh, versus now Lebanese or Syrian. And um, to Khaled, uh, I have, of course, uh, uh, also a host of questions, but maybe I will start uh, by asking um, uh, um, a, a specific question uh, concerning um, uh, something you, you've, you've mentioned in, uh, in your talk right now, which was actually uh, the, the role and the weight uh, that labor groups played in Canada uh, in supporting um, uh, solidarity with Arabs, which we, we, we are seeing also uh, manifestly today, and how, uh, um, how this uh, really um, uh, developed uh, after you arrived in Canada in 1967. Another question is, of course, how does one survive the McDonald uh, Commission's report um, and uh, and keep fighting, you know, uh, given uh, and, and keep actually one's faith, you know, in in, uh, in the Canadian polity? Uh, uh, this is a question um, that I, I keep asking myself, you know, uh, the, the extent to which uh, Canadian Arabs have been loyal to a Canadian state that has... Uh, more than once stabbed them, <laughs> not not even in the back, uh, up front. Um, and maybe another question I would uh, put to you uh, relates uh, actually to uh, uh, your Brazilian life and whether uh, the organizing uh, that happened in Canada was uh, at all connected with um, uh, former uh, organizing elsewhere. I'll stop there and let uh, everyone uh, uh, react. Um, well, if, I'll, I'll, starting, I'll, starting with Huda, I think. 
I'll start with the Brazilian I, one. I think we will start with with Huda since I I put questions yeah. in that order, and then we move to um, to Muna and then to you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Diala, for all these important uh, points and questions. I'm never comfortable with personal questions, actually. I come from a, a historian background before, before becoming a kind of sociologist now. <laughs> so um, I wanted actually to put some kind of history about personal things in my PhD. And I guess at that time, it wasn't really, it was kind of seen as something that will maybe put less, disqualify maybe the neutrality I was supposed to have. I guess now with sociology and everything I've, uh, I've studied since then, I, I regret that actually. So the story of my grandfather is, is kind of very, very blurry. So he was just an orphan. And because his father and mother left for uh, America and we never knew, knew why, where in America, actually, and this is one of the things I would like to research. I never knew my grandfather. He passed away when I was three years ago. So it's a kind of mythological family history where we knew that at three years old during the First World War, he was left with the, with the nuns and, uh, and his parents never came back. And they, I guess, died in America. We think it might be New York. And everyone in the family has a different narrative about it. And he had a different narrative about it. So it's a kind of uh, legend. And I would like to research that, actually. But um, I, could, I could pay tribute to, to the other people in my family, like my aunt who passed away last year and who uh, lived in Canada for really long and who told me to come to Canada, actually, since really long. And this is why I, I started to look towards this direction. And, um, and I started to, to construct the whole historical research I conducted personal uh, history. So, um, but maybe on a more uh, important level, I think that uh, being um, Arab myself, uh, speaking Arabic, um, I was able to connect differently with the with the people I was meeting. I was able to understand better, I think, the narratives and the cultural. And I was actually uh, very well uh, accepted and helped by everyone, like Ammo Khaled, I used to call Ammo Khaled at the time, uh, by Ammo Habib and others. So I was kind of the young uh, Arab who was doing her research on Canada. And I think it, it kind of helped, actually. And after that, I did a lot of research on uh, Muslim women in France, in, in Canada, about Islamophobia, hate acts. And each time, I guess, being a racialized um, scholar and uh, being myself very understanding of the experience of discrimination, of racism, of uh, what is it to be an immigrant, always helped me a lot, actually getting uh, the, the stories and understanding and analyzing, actually, with still uh, a neutrality or a kind of neutrality, but asking the right questions. So I think this is important to, to, um, to talk about as a reflexive point of view and how um, uh, people who are like actually um, engaging in, uh, uh, in research um, are, are like have different skills to do it and, and could connect differently with the people they interview. So maybe, I don't know if I'm answering really the question, but. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, and this is a very moving uh, uh, for, um, revelation you've made to us. Uh, I, I, I hope I haven't prompted something <laughs> uh, you were not prepared to say, but this is a, a very moving story. I was I was just very intrigued by the formulation, uh, uh, America's orphan. So. Uh, I, I now understand uh, uh, the well. I understand, yeah, partly the background of where this is coming from. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Muna, would you care to uh, to respond? Sure. Okay. First of all, it was a very interesting question you've posed, and it's really important, actually, in the sense that my grandparents arrived from Syria. That's what they knew. They knew Beirut was in Syria. They went out west and they lost all the connections physically by going back to the old country, but they had friends, as I said, 
who were from their generation that were, had emigrated as well. They knew themselves as Syrians. That's all there was. As um, my father told me a story that in 1940-something, I'm sorry, I don't remember the year exactly, so it must have been 45, 46, my grandfather and grandmother as well in Saskatchewan received a letter from the French mandate of Syria, Lebanon, asking him to sign and her to sign a form that stated that they were now Lebanese. And my grandfather ripped it up because he wouldn't accept it. He didn't have anything against the Lebanese per se, or the country called Lebanon or the area of, of Syria called Lebanon. His problem was that he lived under Ottoman occupation. And again, they were not the Arabs or the Syrians of that region and all of greater Syria did not have the, uh, the ability to make their own plans for their own future. Everything was controlled by foreigners, as he said to us. Even my grandfather told us as we were young. When France and Britain came into the area, and again, we have a new imperialist, colonialist power taking over, my grandfather couldn't accept it. In fact, there's a really good story that my father told us. In 1947, he went to visit his parents, and my grandparents had a cafe at that time in a little city called Neville. He walked into the cafe. He hadn't seen them for about six months. He walked in and he saw my grandfather, who was quite, my, fa my grandfather was quite stoic. Uh, you never really saw him cry. But my father saw him, when he walked in, he saw my grandfather, his head on the counter, crying like a baby. And my father said, what's wrong? He thought something had happened. And my grandfather said, this is the ultimate humiliation of the Arabs. So he recognized the whole system, the business of Palestine. So for him, he was more encompassing in the sense that Everybody that spoke Arabic was part of his community. My grandfather and grandmother, and also my mother's mother, and again, I can't speak of my father's of my mother's father because I, we didn't know him. But my grandmother was very influential in our, both grandparents were both influential in our life. But my grandmother from Damascus, Nabiha, and my Siti Shems and my Jiddi Jirjas, they all had nothing bad to say about other Arabs, religion, as I said, I'm going to keep underlining the fact that religion had nothing to do with us us growing up. We knew what we were later on in life, basically, but we, it was never part of our being. We were raised as Arab Canadians. We were raised as Canadians of Arab stock. Do not deny your heritage. Never deny your heritage, because this is what makes you who you are. You have an identity. And for me, Huda's title of her book was really important because I do have that identity and I've got nothing to hide about it because I like being what I am. I've never denounced it, denied it. I've got stories to tell you about um, the September 11 attacks. I've got stories to tell you as a grown up person, what happened to me. I don't want to go into that. But no. I have to say that the Ottoman, the, the, the identification of a person is based upon that person how they see themselves, and how strong they have an adherence to their own nationality or origin. We even have a family tree. We know which tribe we come from. That's how strong it is in our family. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Khaled? Okay. I'll, yes, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with, with my experience in Brazil. Brazil, when, when, when I arrived in Brazil, I felt really great because the governor of the state of Sao Paulo, the biggest state, was was an of Arab descent, and he actually later tried to run for president, but he lost. But uh, you, wherever you went, you were respected, received. You know, Arab, Arab. You know, the food, sfiha and kibbe is popular all over the place. You buy it like from kiosks. At at, at the same time, I saw a documentary on TV on 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 the national TV, showing that the first Portuguese discoverers who are who landed in Brazil wrote in Arabic the, the manuscripts. They showed manuscripts which were written in Arabic. So the sailors who were leading the ships that landed in Brazil were Arab from Spain, you know, and Portugal from the Iberian Peninsula. And then I came to Canada, and and so I said, "What's this? They can't do that to us Arabs." So we had to speak out. Then I, I talk about the McDonald Commission. McDonald Commission, you know, it, the McDonald Commission just proved something, which is that the police and the RCMP in this country have been targeting, first of all, the indigenous people, then, uh, you know, uh, racial groups like blacks and others, and then uh, mainly, uh, and then Arabs and Muslims, you know. 
And this is why they were responsible for the torture, for the imprisonment and torture of people like Maher Arar and Al-Malki and others. And uh, they were responsible also for for the bugging of, uh, of, of, of Arab organizations. And so, uh, so unfortunately, this will stay because we have to understand the colonial you know, history of this country. White Europeans feel that they, they are the founders of this country, even though it was stolen from the indigenous people. So they, 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 they always look down on anybody else this uh, this thing is changing because the composition, the population composition is changing, and this is why we also find reaction from uh, from people who insist who in insist on maintaining the superiority of the white Europeans who uh, who uh, came into this country. So now labor, uh, why why we had to deal with labor because. Amongst the labor uh, uh, leadership, there were lots of people who belonged to either minorities or ethnic groups, which were also, uh, uh, you know, uh, treated badly. Uh, for example, we had in the labor union, we had Sid Ryan, who's of Irish descent, but the Irish were, <laughs> were colonized and victimized by the British. So they were more understanding of what happens to people like the Arabs and the Palestinians. We had uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, and there were lots of people there from minority and racial groups. So, uh, so they were always taking stands, supporting, calling for boycott. Uh, you know, they had been calling for boycott in, since, uh, since the 2000 onwards uh, of Israel. And, uh, and we seem to be uh, uh, getting even f uh, more and more. And hopefully, they are also uh, giving us slowly a foot in the Green Party and the, in the New Democratic Party, because these are parties which supposedly have progressive elements uh, uh, representing uh, all social status in Canada. So, uh, so this th this is where I think the focus should be, and we have to understand that uh, you know the the institutions in this country uh, the main the just the, the legal institutions the uh, the police institutions have still not changed there is work to be done there because they are the ones who are blocking actually uh, fundamental uh, rights and equality between all canadians but I am positive, and I see that uh, the light is shining. Yes, I am uh, actually uh, uh, amazed and admirative before your uh, optimism, Khaled. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, uh, yes, because it has to be really underscored uh, to, to, to remain uh, optimistic and militant in the face of uh, systemic racism is, is, uh, is, is quite something. Um, uh, maybe I, I, I would like to a question sorry, to ask, actually. Yes. I, I, I also forgot to mention one thing. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But we also have, you know, for the last 20 years, we've had strong uh, solidarity from Jewish groups who are anti-Zionist because our problem, as I said, you know, from the start was not only from, from the, uh, the, the racism by the system, but also from lobby groups, from Israeli lobby groups, who support uh, the racism uh, which is uh, which uh, which Israel is inflicting on the Arabs and the Palestinians specifically. So, so in Canada now we have very strong, uh, very active uh, in you know Jewish groups, especially independent Jewish voices, which have also been assisting us in in making links with uh, with. With with other groups, you know, in labor and 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 uh, and, and the, the the progressive elements. Um, uh, the the question I actually wanted to put uh, to to all of you uh, relates to what, uh, unfortunately, and and uh, despite uh, uh, Khaled's. Uh, uh, <laughs> optimism, I have to say, but still, I'm, I'm uh, always an optimist because because 
Yeah, there, I'm not finished. <laughs> the, uh, um, there, there, there still is on the um, uh, Arab organizing scene uh, in Canada uh, the fragmentation that you document in your uh, in your book, um, Huda. So my question, actually, to all of you is, and it has to do with this incredible uh, uh, resilience of Arab loyalty to Canada. Does it have to do with the fact that Arabs actually bought into the liberal framework of the Canadian project, which is a colonial project? Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, your father's uh, awakening, you know, to to the, the, the incredible irony of being, you know, granted a piece of land uh, uh, and, and by by a colonizing state coming from a region that is being colonized is, is, is quite uh, illustrative of that. So my question is to, uh, um, it is related to the relationship of uh, Arab, uh, Canadian Arabs towards uh, liberalism, uh, as a, not just as a party, as a, as a liberal, uh, uh, as a general ideology, I mean. So I don't know who would care to, uh, to answer. I'll go first. I think that it's really based upon individuals and how they see the world, how they view the world. In our case, our family was very open to everything. We got, we, my father and mother both taught us to, to accept others as they are, but to also teach others. That's the most important thing. Um, do my, my, we grew up knowing that others had been taken over, had been oppressed. We knew that word. We understood that word. We weren't the oppressors, but we were part of the nation of oppressed, as we saw it. But because we had the privilege of, privilege of education, free education in this country, in fact, and we had the independence and to go on and do what we wanted with strong family support, we were taught the rights and wrongs of humanity. And that's my family. I can't say that for others. Well, there's other people, other other fellow Arab countrymen or Arab Canadian countrymen from various backgrounds of the Arab world who don't think like us. And it's the way they're taught, the way they came there. It's within their own uh, community or uh, essence of how they live. Some believe that they're better than others. Others don't. I, I cannot I cannot say that there is a standardized way of thinking. But for my family, there is. We believe in the human rights of everybody, that everybody has the right to existence and that nobody should be controlled by others. That's how we look at it. And that's how we were raised, and that's why my father's such a great man to me. That's why. Thanks, Mona. Okay. Anyone else would uh, care to? Uh, well, uh, I, keeping, keeping it short, because I think we're uh, running out of time. Uh, I don't know. Why. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think it's, it, it, I, I think the Arab community is always saying bad things about themselves all the time. So there is this self, <laughs> um, I don't know, a uh, way of seeing uh, seeing ourselves. I don't know how to say it, but um, I think it's a, it's a very heterogeneous group today. And I'm not even sure if I have to write about uh, this populations uh, now. I would call them even Arabs. I'm not sure there is a unity, and actually I'm sure there is not. So I think it's very diverse. And I think from what I learned looking at really uh, detailed history in the 60s and the 70s, I saw that there were many leftists, many revolutionary. There were many uh, discourse they, that, that had conversions of struggles uh, with anti-racism, with indigenous struggles, etc. So... I'm hoping, and I think I see it today also in the activist scene, that there are many individuals that go who goes in this direction and goes on demonstration and fights uh, for all minority rights and for uh, for something more broad uh, around social justice. So yes, of course, many of them, like all immigrants, are liberal, but it's true in many many communities actually. But uh, they're not. So different than others, if I if I if I may. So I I, I would say let's look at each uh, movement in the group and maybe just see them like the whole Canadian community 
having all these diverse positions um, on on many on many topics, and maybe focus on the more radical ones on on the on the right side of the spectrum and the one of social justice, of course. Okay, maybe I was uh, I I had in mind uh, a more contemporary situation uh, of the, of of the mainstream associations, but you, you're of course right about But so. there are the two, like you have the mainstream organization that, that could be more mainstream and you have others that are still, have still very strong positions on Palestinian rights, on anti-racism, anti-colonialism, anti anti-imperialism. It also exists, so, well. Okay, I, 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 I'd like to mention something. I, I'm, until 2011, when we had 40 members uh, uh, societies in the federation. We had Iraqis, we had Somalis, uh, Moroccans, Egyptian, Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese. So uh, all of them were willing to work t together. I think the events in the Arab world since 2011, and maybe a little earlier, starting with the invasion of Iraq and what happened in Iraq, uh, it started to create the divisions, you know, between uh, sects sometimes and between also uh, political parties and the community here. So, and some and some of these people then said, say, you know, okay, you don't like Canada, but what's happening in this Arab country is worse. Be happy with what your situation in Canada. So these are the the people who are uh, defeatist, or you call them the liberal, you know, because they say we we don't have to change anything. It's better than back home, you know. And uh, unfortunately, the events which are, which are happening in the Arab world are 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 helping that that mind frame. But I think that won't last too long. Also, okay. thank you very much. I just need to check uh, as far as the time is concerned. Oinda, do we still have? Uh, some more time for further discussion. I'm not hearing you, I'm afraid. Linda, she's not there. She is, we can see her, but we cannot hear her. <laughs> Okay, while she uh, finds a way to get back to us, I, I, I think I will put a, a, another, uh, another question since it seems we, uh, we still have uh, some 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I think, uh, I mean, there are many strengths um, uh, in, your, in, your, in, your, uh, in your book, uh, Huda, uh, one of them being, of course, uh, uh, showing, you know, the history of uh, immigration laws, how they evolved, how they actually suffocated uh, the early community um, between uh, 1910 and 19 uh, and the 30s, I think, um, uh, and and up to today, how we move from uh, uh, anti-Asianism or anti-Asiatic uh, feelings and policies in Canada. Um, uh, um, and then, you know, where Syrians somehow are identified as this intermediate category, uh, not really black, but not really white. Uh, and then uh, as we move further, uh, closer to us um, with the uh, um, full-blown uh, Islamophobia uh, of today. So I think, uh, of course, your book uh, stops in the 70s and you've explained why in the, int in, in the introduction. Um, but um, uh, I think one of the strengths was really to show uh, uh, the evolution of uh, uh, the communities inside uh, the, the, an evolving uh, legal framework um, in Canada. Um, and uh, for instance, you show that uh, before 1931, the category Muslim does not exist, uh, which is, of course, very interesting to anyone researching Islamophobia and, you know, uh, all those uh, racial, uh, ethnic, uh, uh, religious categories that uh, feed into uh, racist frameworks. 
Um, this this being said, uh, uh, and yes, and of course, while doing that, you also show you know uh, um, the the ignorance of uh, the general population, which welcomes you know uh, the first peddlers who have no idea uh, with whom they're dealing with and who think you know uh, those Arabs or Syrians might be Greeks or Italians. And, you know, uh, eventually uh, those categories of black Syrians or black Jews uh, evolved out of uh, those uh, um, the first experiences. Uh, now that you have uh, given us uh, this uh, fresco, you know, uh, this one century fresco uh, uh, to read, and uh, you've rec recorded this uh, extremely important history of Honestly, a community against all odds, maybe not more than any other stigmatized immigrant diasporic community, but you have shown in what way, you know, it was a community against all odds. And my question to you is to, uh, is whether uh, there would be a sequel to this book, to this research. Um, uh, would you actually uh, think of, you know, uh, continuing the story beyond the 70s and up till today. Um, researching maybe uh, giving us, you know, a, a place that becomes bigger as the book progresses to the Palestinian community since the Palestinians uh, uh, appear on the Canadian uh, scene later than uh, what would become Syrians and, and Lebanese. So yeah, uh, would, uh, might there be a sequel to this, uh, to this wonderful book? I would love to actually, but I also encourage a lot of like new scholars and young people to, to go and research more uh, in depth because uh, doing a PhD is, is, is one of the way to go really in depth in this kind of research, as you, as you know, as every, everybody knows. Um, but actually, I think what's really missing is the whole history of the 80s and the 90s. And there is not so many uh, uh, studies about it. Brian Aboud did a little bit about the association around that. But still, I think there is something to be done about that. And I kind of jumped uh, into uh, contemporary Islamophobia and I, I, I did research uh, Islamophobic and racist acts in, uh, in Quebec recently. So I kind of continued a little bit about around this, these communities, because again, these communities are really broad and, uh, and it's really complicated to just now do a research about all the Arab countries, because as you know, now we have like the religious uh, diversity, but there is also the North African and the Middle Eastern uh, Arab or Arabic speaking communities. And even even if there is for me links and, and continuity, uh, there is there are also big differences among them, and um, so well I hope I hope other people will research more about this group, but also in relationship with other uh, communities and with like a whole history of minorities, as I was saying, and uh, and maybe one of the things I would like to point out that's really important, and I realized that doing my PhD, is how much uh, the international uh, policy plays a, an important role. And in this specific community, it's maybe more or less real, uh, in, in, it's it accurate for other groups, but for, for the Arabs and Muslims, the way the Canadian state or any state relates with the countries of origins will have a real big impact on the diasporas. And this is also important on the researches around transnationalism, for example, where you see that some embassies and some home countries are really interested in the faith of their of their uh, on the faith sorry of their of their communities abroad, and which was not so much the case for the Arab uh, countries. Only like the real interest they had was more from dictatorship uh, to surveil their like uh, activists abroad or opponents but like to encourage, to, to fund, to help, or to just sustain in a way or another was, maybe it's a chance actually, which let, let them be independent in the 70s, but still it's also explained where they are weak and why when they lobby the state for um, demands 
related to the home country, but also against discrimination that uh, regard them, it's uh, they're also not uh, don't don't weigh so much in the balance. So mm -hmm. I think this is really important. And it's also more important when we see the consequences of war on terror, of all the wars that are made in the Middle East and abroad, like even Afghanistan, etc. And all of this has a big impact mm -hmm. on how we perceive and how those communities will be treated uh, in Canada. And that's also explain why they are maybe a bit uh, why reluctant also to, to resist because they've always been repressed and surveilled. And this is also important to take into account because intimidation is something that works in a way to, to weaken a movement. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, and uh, well, I do hope uh, there will be a sequel <laughs> in whichever direction you decide to take it, whether to uh, take into account uh, the newcomers on the scene or, you know, to maybe fo uh, rather focus on one particular national community uh, among the, the bigger Arab uh, group, as you call it in your book. Uh, I, 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 if uh, I would like to uh, give you the last word, any one of you, if uh, if you would like to say uh, a final word. Uh, otherwise, if not, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, for uh, uh, this engaging conversation, and uh, I wish all the best uh, for uh, uh, to all of you, and uh, I wish all the best uh, for the book. Uh, uh, it deserves all the success in the world. And again, I am extremely happy that uh, it was translated into English. It has to reach its, um, its, its first uh, actors and members, uh, the, the members of the Arab communities of Canada. Um, if well, I, I'll, I'll just say one thing, you know, the we, you know, Arab Canadians uh, will will uh, will will continue to have challenges, uh, but now the Chinese Canadians are are going to have, be facing more challenges. It looks because mm -hmm. this is a trend. You know, at one time it was uh, Soviet Union, and then Islamophobia be became the major issue, and since most Arabs are Muslims and Palestinians, most Palestinians are Muslims. You have uh, this campaign against uh, against the Arabs, you know, by the Israel lobby and by evangelical Christians who say, you know, these Arabs and Muslims are preventing, you know, the second coming of Jesus Christ. But, uh, but now, uh, because China is growing economically, uh, North America, the, the Americans, the British, these guys are focusing now on China. And that's why you had an incident uh, 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 yesterday in Atlanta. A young white man goes into these places, kills eight, eight Chinese women. So the Chinese are now the target, which means uh, there's less pressure on the Arabs and Muslims. But, but, uh, but this is a temporary thing. So... Um, so uh, racism still exists in Canada, as I said, in the institutions, in the main institutions, government, police, judiciary, and this will target, and the victims will, will always be racial and religious groups. Okay, um, if, uh, if that's it, uh, I will... Uh, Turn the mic to uh, to the uh, to the convener, to the organizer of uh, this book launch, uh, Oyinda, and uh, wish everyone uh, a very good evening and uh, thank everyone for having uh, been with us. Well, I would like to thank everybody for bringing the word out that there is a community and it can be revived. They have to fix themselves first before they do anything. But honestly, Huda, your book is a is a something a prize here because there were books before, and you're continuing the tradition but making it even stronger. So you are helping the community by this with this publication. So I really thank you for this. It needs to be translated into Arabic as well, by the way. Okay. 
<laughs> really gonna, you have to find somebody now. <laughs> Thank but you. That man will be a good man, you know, he's good. Thanks to everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye bye, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Please remember to subscribe to Fernwood's YouTube channel and also remember to buy Hooter's book, Identifying as Arab in Canada on Fernwood Publishing and get 20% off from now until March 24th. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. You can still watch this video on YouTube by subscribing to our YouTube channel or just going to our YouTube channel and um, what you would find the video on there. If you do want to watch the video after today, you can just save this link and watch it directly on this link. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your week.